Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on whether you're joining us from a different time zone. Could I ask one of the people who have their cameras on to just give me a thumbs up to tell me that they can hear me? Fantastic. That's always a good start. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, for those of you who I've not met before, my name's Emma Bridges, and for the last three years, I've been the Public Engagement Fellow at the Institute of Classical Studies in London. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this special event, celebrating the winners of our 2020 Public Engagement Awards. I'm going to start with a kind of slightly boring housekeeping stuff before we move into the main business of the day. Just a couple of, of notices. It'd be really helpful if everyone except the person who's speaking could keep their microphones muted just to avoid any kind of interruptions or background noise or feedback. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions to those who are presenting today. Um, if you can do that basically by typing your questions in the chat box and the person who is chairing the talk, um, for one of the talks that'll be me and for the other that'll be April Pudsey, um, will kind of relay those questions to the, um, the speaker. Um, so there'll be, as I say, opportunities to, to ask questions in that way, but not over the microphone. Um, you're very welcome to either leave your camera off if you prefer or put your camera on. It's, it's entirely up to you, but do be aware that this event is being recorded, hopefully so that we can upload it to the ICS's YouTube channel in future. Um, so if you have your camera on, then you may appear um, visually in, in the final recording. Um, so on to the main proceedings. First of all, I need to um, offer a few thanks to various people. And that, the thanks go first to our anonymous donor, whose generous gift has made these awards possible. Um, this person gave us the money simply with an instruction that we could use it in whatever way we saw fit to support public engagement in classics in the UK. And we decided at the ICS that um, awards like this would be a really good way to celebrate some of the excellent work that's happening. So big thanks to our donor for making that possible. Um, I'd also really like to thank my fellow judges on the judging panel. So um, that's Dr. Emma Cole, Dr. April Pudsey and Dr. Henry Stead. They've been very generous with their time and they took a lot of care in reading and assessing the application. So big thanks to them. You'll actually hear a little bit from, from April later because April's going to be chairing one of the presentations. Um, now, I know this seems like a really trite thing to say, but I can honestly say that the field of applications for these awards was incredibly impressive. We had a real range of, of entries that really kind of showcased the breadth of different kinds of public engagement in classics and related subjects that's going on across the UK, um, from hyper local projects to um, sort of bigger projects that are operating nationally, um, everything from projects that are operating on a, on a shoestring or, or with literally no budget at all um, to those which have been successful in getting funding from some of the major funders, uh, things that were being delivered purely online, things that are delivered for in face-to-face -face ways and, and, and various kind of hybrid forms of, of lots of different kinds of engagements. Um, so we as the judging panel were hugely cheered, I think it's fair to say, by the quality of the work and the dedication of the people who are doing it and the time and effort they put into sharing their research with wider audiences. Um, it's a great shame that often this kind of work goes largely unrecognized um, and isn't always well supported. So it's really lovely that we're able to do our bit to redress that balance a little bit with, with these awards and to share some of that great work. In the end, the two projects that we chose were ones where we felt that both the recognition and the financial reward would really make a difference to those projects. We also um, were glad that we could support projects which are taking place in areas of the UK which have often been not so well served by this kind of work. Um, they're also both really fantastic examples of university researchers working in partnership with other organisations beyond the university itself. And that is one of the keystones of outstanding public engagement. So I'm going to start by introducing the first project. There's a slight change to the running order that was advertised on the ICS website just because of timings of when speakers were available. So we're going to start with the project um, from Dr Sally Waits and Dr Susanna Philippo from Newcastle University. 
I'm going to introduce that um, and allow them to tell you a bit about the project. And then there'll be an opportunity to ask them questions. And then after, after that question and answer session, we'll hand over to April Pudsey, who will chair the presentation by Essam Hussain and Ken Griffin from Swansea. Um, so it's a real pleasure to introduce the project um, which was given one of the awards, um, which is led by Dr. Sally Witt and Dr. Susanna Philippol from Newcastle University. Their project title is Greece Recreated Classical Inspirations at Belsay Hall. It's really a multifaceted project based in the northeast of England, um, and it draws on the research of both the project leads. One of the things that really, really impressed all of us on the panel about this project was the way in which both academic researchers have built lasting relationships with multiple community partners. Um, English Heritage, who manage Belsay Hall in Northumberland, the Great North Museum, local schools and creative practitioners. Now this enables them to reach a really wide range of audiences with their research. People who may not ordinarily have opportunities for whatever reason to engage with research in classics that's going on in universities. There's a real, in fact, an extraordinary energy and drive behind this project. We really wanted to commend Dr. Waite and Dr. Philippo for all they've achieved so far. And we're really looking forward to seeing where they go next with this project. In particular, it was clear that they'd put a lot of thought in to how to adapt what they're doing in the current climate so that they can still make an impact at a time when in-person activities are subject to limitations. So I'm going to hand over to them now to tell you a bit more about the project. So over to Sally and Susanna. Um, I shall mute myself and hopefully you two can both. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, could you, Sally, can you confirm that I'm audio, audible? Good. Um, I'd start with a very quick apology. Um, because of where I am and having to catch a bus, I'm going to have to make a very sharp exit in about 10 minutes' time um, and hand over to Sally. I will rejoin later if I can. Um, anyway, um, just to uh, follow on from what Emma Bridges was saying, um, our project is a collaboration that's arisen from previous projects with both the Great North Museum and the English Heritage. Uh, and it's building on previous research and engagement work we've both been undertaking. Uh, in Sally's case, it's already partly come to fruition. In my case, it's still waiting, partly because of COVID. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce our research and the impact that that's had, and then outline our project's plans for the new project. And we're hoping that's going to communicate research to a new and wider audience. Before we begin, um, again, I'd uh, like to sort of give our thanks to both to the anonymous donor for their generosity and to the Institute of Classical Studies for this award, and particularly for uh, funding our project. Uh, we're very grateful, especially to Emma, um, who gave a lot of help and encouragement um, as we were setting up the application. Um, Emma's done a lot for uh, promoting the classics, um, and this is just one part of that, so we're very grateful. Okay, um, so my own research to start with, um, what it does is it looks at the various writings by Sir Charles Monk, the owner of Belsay Hall, exploring the ways in which he was inspired by the classical world. Um, now the most obvious and prominent aspect of that was the physical aspects of the classical world, and they had the most obvious legacy in his design of the house and landscape at Belsay Estate in Northumberland. Um, and picking up from the diaries, it's clear that from his visit in 1805, the then so-called Thessalon um, was the building that Monk most admired, um, like the Parthenon, but had some criticisms of it. Um, and he ends up basing the main front of Belsay Hall, which you can see in the top right there, uh, on the dimensions of the Thessalon. Uh, the image on the bottom right there, which is from the archives, uh, is a sketch for the elevation. And it's got sort of notes about the measurements, which are all based on the Thessalon. Um, there's a nice quotation from his diary as to what he liked about it. He says, the temple of Theseus gives you an idea of having stood above 2,000 years. It stands so calm and serene, giving the, sorry, um, slight problems here. It stands so firm and sedate, seeming immovable. And I think it was those uh, ideas of permanence which he wanted to transfer to Belsay. Um, uh, we've got a drawing by Monk there, um, and uh, also images of the various sort of, of the temple and the house, you can see the connection. The second aspect uh, that inspires Monk, and this has been a particular development uh, that English heritage has been interested in because they're looking at uh, 
linking together the various aspects of the site. Um, our, if you see on the left there, these rather wonderful quarry gardens. The stone from the hall was quarried from the estate, some of you might know, um, but it wasn't just utilitarian, it was then uh, landscaped into this beautiful, um, sort of sublime, slightly uh, sometimes gloomy and awe-inspiring um, landscape in that respect. And again, the diaries make it clear that uh, places that he encountered when he visited the Mediterranean inspire this. Um, the most famous uh, inspiration are the, uh, the Syracuse quarries, uh, not originally a garden, of course, uh, originally also a quarry in the prison. Um, that's a picture in the middle. Um, but he didn't actually see those monk himself in person until 1831, when he finally went to Sicily. Um, he would have seen drawings, but not the thing in person. Um, and what was interesting about the earlier diaries from uh, the early 1800s is that there were sites he visited uh, at that time before the building of Belsay Hall, um, which is 1807 to 1817, uh, which probably also fed into this. Most notably, this rather wonderful thing called the Cave of Pan at Bari, or the Nymphalet. Um, like uh, Syracuse, like his own quarry gardens, these have got dramatic rock formations, some of them natural, some of them man-made and carved, a sequence of underground caverns that are lit from above, like the quarries, and various rough carvings of man and animal, and the uh, Belsey Hall um, and English Heritage are interested in this, particularly because of the connection to the wild man imagery at their site. But, um, thirdly, um, the other aspect, and this is what feeds into the, if you like, the, the publication output of my research is uh, Charles Monk's inspiration with literature. Um, his lifelong engagement with classical literature, which comes across in the travel diaries, in his uh, sort of day-to-day -day notebooks, and in his uh, late life manuscript translation of part of the Iliad, is central to what I'm doing. Um, what interests me here is how people first get interested in uh, the classical world. And for Monk, it was language and literature uh, from his school days um, that first drew him to the classical world. And the, one of the key things in the diaries is that literary quotation becomes one important way in which he engages with what he sees on his travels, including things like uh, prickly pear and um, unfortunate encounters with flooding rivers. You get quotations from um, Horace and uh, Virgil at this point. Um, the uh, image from the diary at the top there is it doesn't have a quotation um, on it. It's a page with a drawing and uh, some of his sort of notes, but it was one of the occasions where he did uh, refer to classical mythology. There's a delightful reference to um, a flower which he thinks might be the one that Persephone was gathering when Pluto behaved so rudely to her. It's a splendid euphemism. Um, and at the bottom there we've got a small excerpt from uh, the Iliad translation. Um, and this links nicely back, this is done when he's in his 70s, but links nicely back to the quotations that uh, occur in um, Monk's diaries. He quotes the bit about the crickets, uh, the Tettingses, um, when he's at uh, the Temple of Egina, which is another dark temple, which is something he was most impressed by. Just very quickly to say that um, where this has been leading on the engagement side, I've been working with English Heritage on new content for their website, along with uh, their own uh, project to promote the site called Belsey Awakes. Um, the idea is to enhance the visitor experience, to have something that people can walk around the site with. Um, it's based on an interactive map. Um, and uh, I've also managed to feed into some of the new history pages that have already gone live, uh, written by Andrew Hahn. Okay, I think probably that's enough for me. So I'll hand over to Sally and thank you very much. And so, sorry about the, the rapidity with which I have to leave. Um. Thanks, Susanna. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and engagement activities before moving on to tell you a little bit about the project. Mm -hmm. My research focuses on the Shefton collection of Greek archaeology in the Great North Museum in Newcastle and um, particularly on the reception of Greek antiquity, so the history of collections. I've co-curated a series of exhibitions, most recently an exhibition in the Great North Museum to celebrate the centenary of Brian Shefton's birth in 2019. Aside from exhibitions, my engagement work has centred on the development and delivery of an innovative community curriculum for teaching ancient Greece in primary schools, the Great North Children's Hospital and the Great North Museum. The curriculum was developed 
in collaboration with colleagues in the Centre for Learning and Teaching at Newcastle University. And we worked with two schools, West Jesmond Primary and Belsay School. The curriculum is organised around the Shefton Collection. And on the slide here, I've just very briefly tried to outline what the essence of a community curriculum is. So it's really about pupils um, doing things, meeting people, making things and uh, increasing their cultural capital. This project has resulted in the production of a range of resources for teachers, which are now all available on our Explore the Past with Us website. Um, the idea being that teachers can dip in and choose the topics that they want to teach. There's worksheets and suggested activities. Our work with Belsay School on this project led to reimagining ancient Greece an exhibition which was curated in collaboration with the Great North Museum and English Heritage and was held at Belsay Hall. Here we place the children's artworks alongside the artefacts from the Shefton collection um, which had inspired them and you can see on this uh, slide some examples of that work. The children worked with two creative practitioners and their work was also incorporated into the exhibition. So I work a lot with Graham from Potted History and on the left there you can see uh, this clay model of Pan which he made with the children um, in a mould for this project and we then displayed it in the exhibition. And on the right you can see Mina's work um, which was displayed. She worked with the children on the collages and watercolours and then display, displayed some of her own work which is inspired by uh, ancient Greece and was directly inspired by the collection and by Belsay Hall. Oops, jumped ahead a bit there. So we've used, uh, when we did the Reimagining Greece exhibition, we used Susanna's research on Charles Monk for our exhibition panels and we talked about the prospect of another exhibition in the Great North Museum based on our research. So the original plan was to have a small temporary exhibition but the ongoing pandemic means that this will not be possible for the foreseeable future. The small exhibition space is um, closed because of the pandemic and the Great North Museum only opened again last week. The museum is however keen to develop online content to maintain existing audiences and build new ones. Uh, for English Heritage it's hoped that the exhibition will encourage and enhance a visit to Belsay but obviously for those who are interested in the legacy of ancient Greece and are unable to visit either the Great North Museum or Belsay Hall the exhibition will provide an introduction to the Shefton collection and Charles Monk's redevelopment of the Belsay estate. This award has allowed, uh, allowed us to collaborate on an online exhibition exploring the influence of classical literature and Greek archaeology on Monk and expressed in his development of the Belsay estate. Monk's diaries alongside artefacts from the Shefton collection will be used to recreate the story of his Mediterranean travels, exploring the ways in which the classical past inspired him. And yesterday I re received a few screenshots of the, the kind of beginning of our exhibition. So I'm really pleased to be able to share those with you to today. Monk's Travels in the Mediterranean, first his epic honeymoon to Greece in 1804 to 1806, and a later journey to the island of Sicily in 1831, provides the narrative structure for our exhibition. And as you can see on the left there, we're focusing on several key stops on his journey. Audio clips of Monk's diary will be contextualized through photographs, drawings, and paintings. And this will be 
um, these will be linked to artifacts from the Shefton collection. So I've been working with Andrew Parkin, the Keeper of Archaeology at the Great North Museum, to identify objects we could use to match to Monk's Diary entries, which has been really interesting and is allowing us to showcase some of the pieces that are often overlooked in our collection. So recent research on artifacts will be um, shown in videos focusing particularly on object biographies. And my PhD student, Daisy Alice Vaughan, will have the opportunity to highlight her research on the Shefton Archive. And this exhibition will provide a case study for her thesis. So the award has enabled us to fund the technical support for the design and development um, and implementation of this exhibition. Neither Susanna or I have experience of creating online exhibitions and it has been a very steep learning curve. Our first instinct was to try to recreate the gallery experience online and we both were delighted by the prospect of having an unlimited word count. We quickly learned that this was entirely the wrong approach and that people generally, when they visit an online exhibition, read very little text and spend very little time on the site. A museological colleague provided us with some examples of best practice in digital content. And we are fortunate to be working um, with an artist. Uh, we're continuing our work with Nina and a graphic designer to develop the website. And with their help, we hope to create a dynamic multimedia exhibition, which offers a very different experience to a museum visit and counters recent critiques of online exhibitions. Thank you. Thank you both so much. That was fantastic. Um, and I really feel I get the sense that this is this feels like about four projects in one. There is so much going on here and it's quite incredible what you've achieved, just the two of you um, so far. So it's going to be um, great to see how this develops in the future. I was really struck by what you said about the kind of the mutual learning process, because, again, that's really key to public engagement. This this sense that there's not just a one way kind of sending out of knowledge into the world that actually everybody involves learns something new and everybody benefits. So that's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to kick off with a question. I'm encouraging people to, to type um, questions in the chat box. I can see there's one there already, but I'm going to kick off with a question, if that's okay, um, Sally, which is, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to build a collaboration with a kind of an organisation like English Heritage? You know, I think colleagues might be more familiar with perhaps working with schools, possibly with museums a little bit, but I think with bigger national organisations. How did you go about that? And um, what, what would you suggest for someone who wants to do something similar? Yes, that's a really good question. And I'm trying to think back to how we established the connection with English heritage. I think it came, you know, quite a few years ago, about four or five years ago from a chat Susanna and I had, and Susanna, correct me if I'm wrong, when you were talking about your project and what you would like to do. Um, and I suggested that we got in contact with English Heritage. And um, I did know, so it's often about people that you already know. So I did know uh, uh, one of the curators at English Heritage had been a PhD student at Newcastle. So I had someone to contact who could then direct me to the, to the correct person, which in this case was Andrew Hahn, who is coordinating the Balsia Wake project. I think it's often that is getting on the bus, I think. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's, she's still there. She's on the bus. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. It, it, it sort of, um, with me, it kind of arose from, I've been taking students on trips to Belsay Hall now for about 15 years, and I was really interested in the site, and then um, I thought I might like to take this further. And it just came at the right time when they were starting to think about their development of the site, because it, it doesn't get the kind of attention that Wallington, the National Trust for property nearby that so it kind of sort of came together that way I think it was a research away day which fed into it if I remember right Sally but, um... so yeah it's often those kind of serendipitous things that then actually you've got to you've got to nurture those relationships and build on those relationships which is clear that you've done this over a really 
long period of time in lots of different ways, which is fantastic. A couple of questions coming in. Um, Sue, one of my colleagues, says, is there a biography of Brian Shefton because he was such a character? Does, does one exist? Do you know? uh, no, it does not exist. We are hoping to, um, we're working at the moment on a funding bid to expand our work on the archive, which is basically all of Brian's uh, papers. Um, and a lot of his possessions, uh, which the university has on loan. Um, and one day that would be a marvellous thing. We have many stories, uh, as do most people that knew Brian Shefton. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I guess that there'll be, be a lot of people looking forward to, to the results of that. Um, and then a, um, a question also from my colleague, Gabby, who says, Armina Hidari weights sculptures inspired by Greek vases 3D printed by any chance? Gabby's got particular interest. In uh, they're mould made. Right. And I, I don't know, what, well, you'll be sharing the website, uh, the, the PowerPoint. I've linked to her website, which talks okay. a little bit more about her practice. OK, fantastic. Um, and then Alice asks, have you had interest from primary schools other than the two you initially worked with for using their resources, uh, your resources in their teaching? Yes, we've done um, a, a couple of continued professional development events for teachers in collaboration with the Great North Museum. Um, and have been approached by uh, various schools. Is that, is the main that... thing is dissemination though, you're right. It's people finding out that we've got those materials available. We've printed out a lot of the guides um, and we're hoping to send those out to schools. We were hoping to do that for the beginning of term, but of course, COVID uh, has delayed us in, in that. I think that's often one of the things, isn't it, with producing resources for schools, kind of getting it out there so that people aren't then reinventing the wheel next time and everybody can share. That's often really, really, really useful. Um, but you did have a link to that and they are available online. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. um, we, we did talk to, uh, we did, this was, um, the curriculum was created in collaboration with teachers. So hopefully it is very much what teachers want rather than a case of what often happens, what academics want to tell the, the yes. teachers. I think that is, that is so key when working with schools as well, this sense of actually ask people what's most useful to them. There's no point spending time and effort producing something, even if it's beautiful and connected perfectly with your research, if it's not going to work in the context that you think it might work. And if you haven't kind of connected with the people who are who are your kind of target audience then really it's it's not a great use of time so that's that's a really good tip as well uh, and Andrew comments um that Andrew Parkin who I believe is from the Great North Museum um says there is a memoir of brain shifting available online um so anyone who's interested in that and there's also a chapter by David Gill so if people want to have a look at that in the chat box if anyone's interested oh and Greg has very helpfully provided a link to uh the Shefton memoir which is brilliant um would anyone else like to ask any questions before we move on to the next project? Or was there anything else, Sally or Susanna, that you wanted to add that we've not had a chance to cover that you were sort of hoping that somebody would ask? Or I'm very happy to send anybody, if anybody wants a copy of our teacher's guide, uh, feel free to email me with your address and I'll post one out to you. It is available online, but we've got nice printed uh, copies in a, in a proper booklet. I can see a couple of hands up and I'm not sure if that's because somebody wants to ask a question. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Um, Go on then, Simon. <laughs> in view of the, the current uh, controversies about connections uh, between slavery and the building of great houses and things like that, I just wondered if there was any relevance to those sorts of issues for uh, these particular things around Belsay Hall or not. And this is exactly when Susanna has disappeared um, were you asking me about illicit antiquities? I could have answered that question, but I have no idea about that in relation to Belsay Hall. I mean, I know myself, I, I did actually check the, uh, the UCL slavery compensation database. Um, and as far as I can see, that the, the monks are not, not involved in that at all. There were no, none of the names, none of the names came up, which I think it may not therefore be relevant, but obviously it's one of those things that people are now much more alert to than they were in the past. Absolutely. I um, certainly haven't been aware of any connection, but Susanna would know better. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Um, so as, as Sally said, if, if you are interested in any of the resources, then do, do um, drop her a line. Um, Sally, you're contact details will be available on the Newcastle website, is that right? Yes, and they're on the PowerPoint as well. Oh, fantastic. Okay. 
Um, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, well, thank you both very much and congratulations on a fantastic project and it'll be wonderful to see this develop in future. And please do kind of share with us the online exhibition, tweet it um, and, and we, can, we can shout about it a bit more. So thank you and, and you're, getting, you're getting kind of applause from various thank people you. In the chat boxes and things as well. Absolutely fantastic. So I'm now um, going to, I'm going to kind of say goodbye and mute myself. Well, I'm not saying goodbye, I'm still going to be here, but I'm going to mute myself for the rest of the session. Um, and I'm going to hand over to April Pudsey, who is going to introduce the next winning project. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Sally and Susanna, for that, that presentation. We, we very much enjoyed reading uh, the applications uh, from both of our winners as well as all the others. Um, the, the next uh, winner of, of our awards, um, the title of this one jumped out at us all straight away as being hugely significant. Um, I'll, I'll read you the title. Uh, it's a bit long-winded, but it's, it says everything. It's Egypt and its neighbours, object-centred approaches to articulating local identity and cultural diversity in antiquity. This jumped out for all the right reasons, um, and particularly for me as well, given that a lot of classics is focused around Greece and Rome, right, rightly so, and, but something that often appears marginal is the relations uh, that, that the Greek and Roman world and cultures have uh, outside of, uh, or, or on the fringes of the Mediterranean. So this was something that, that really jumped out as being something with, with potential for huge significance uh, and the project itself with a huge reach. And it's a collaboration between Dr. Ersin Hussain from Swansea University, a lecturer in classics, uh, ancient history and archaeology department, and Ken Griffin, the curator's uh, uh, manager at uh, the Egypt Centre at Swansea. And uh, Dr. Ersin Hussain is at the moment on maternity leave, so we have Ken with us. Uh, and uh, Dr. Hussain has actually gone into labour, so we, we do wish her all the best. Um, the project deals with the relationships between Egypt and uh, some Cypriot cultures and material, and pro promises to create a gallery for specific objects uh, that up until now have not had uh, the public attention that they ought to have had. The supporting documents we received with this application talked about the work that's previously gone into this that Ersin and Ken had put into making sure they reach different groups within the communities uh, of Swansea. In particular, we had um, a reference from the BME Invest Project Coordinator for Ethnic Minorities and Youth Support Team of Wales, uh, making very clear the impact that this kind of work has on young people from diverse backgrounds uh, across uh, Wales at the moment. And as Emma pointed out earlier, it's great to see uh, work being done in areas of the country, in regions that, that don't necessarily receive a lot of the funding and attention that they deserve. The gallery uh, which is promised and the work which is promised has already been requested by members of the public, as is evident from uh, polls uh, that have been done on previous exhibitions and will be in English, Welsh and Arabic, as well as an online version. So I think we've got a video to show um, with Ersin talking about this, explaining this project to us, and then we'll have a chance for discussion with Ken afterwards. So I think we can play the video. Can we? <laughs> Valerie, do you have the video to play? Ah, yes, she's yes. there. Hello. My name is Ersin Hussain and I'm an ancient historian based here at Swansea University. I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you all today to deliver this presentation live and to personally thank the ICS for the very generous funding that has been awarded to me and my colleagues to facilitate the next stage of our public engagement project. Over the next 10 minutes or so, I will provide an overview of Swansea's Egypt Centre and its impact on research, teaching and public engagement here in Swansea. I will also discuss what our project, Egypt and its Neighbours, will entail and how we are going to engage the wider public here in Swansea and beyond, even more with the fabulous collection that is held at this local institution. 
As you can see from this map, the Egypt Centre is part of Swansea's Singleton campus. The collection that the museum houses arrived from the Wellcome Institute in 1971, and the Egypt Centre was later opened to the public in 1998. The museum itself houses around 6,000 artefacts, 300 objects of which are non-Egyptian, and it is internationally recognised for innovation in widening participation and education. It plays an integral role in teaching and research across Swansea University as well as the local community. For instance, the museum attracts around 22,000 visitors a year, as well as 150 schools. The few images presented here provide a mere snapshot of the many ways in which staff in the Department of Classics, Ancient History and Egyptology engage students with object-centred learning using this fantastic collection. Not only does this enhance the teaching that we offer, but it truly provides our students with a range of unique experiences as they're able to get hands on with the ancient world. This tweet here gives a little insight into some of the most recent work that Dr. Nigel Pollard has been doing with our students working with the numismatic collection held at the museum. Above me, you can see some of our MA students working studiously on individual objects, learning how to write object biographies, and some of these were presented to the wider public. Again, directly above me, you can see a very small workshop that met on a weekly basis, and these students came from my Ancient Cyprus module, and they worked together and learnt how to identify and record different artefacts that are held in the collection. The Egypt Centre also collaborates with departments beyond the College of Arts and Humanities. For example, another recent tweet really flags some of the most cutting edge research undertaken with colleagues in engineering to scan some of the mummified artefacts held in the collection. Above, you can also see two images from a really intensive day of scanning a range of metal artefacts held by the museum, and this was done to determine their composition. Not only does work like this enable us to better understand the nature of the collection, but it provides colleagues and students in other departments with opportunities to better understand the capabilities of the machinery and equipment held in their own departments. By working with colleagues and students across the university, we are then able to disseminate our findings in creative ways to the wider public. As you can see from this screenshot of our website, this includes a whole host of different initiatives, from our competitive volunteering scheme to hosting events online, such as public engagement talks, or getting schools to come in and get hands on with the ancient world. And this brings us to our project, Egypt and its neighbours. When I joined Swansea University in January 2018, I was completely bowled over by the diversity of the Egypt Centre and the energy of its staff to really bring the ancient world to life. Since then, I have worked closely with the curators and the collections access manager to engage students and the wider public with the museum's lesser understood classical artefacts. Most notably, the wonderful and rather eclectic range of objects from ancient Cyprus a place that is very dear to my heart. This has involved examining the collection behind the scenes independently, or as you have seen from the previous slides, with students and colleagues from across the university. This has enabled me to deliver a number of public engagement talks regarding this particular aspect of the museum's collection. And as you can see from this slide, this year this was done via Zoom because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whilst this global event has presented all of us with many challenges, it has also been a major catalyst for really thinking about how we can innovate public engagement. For example, I held a poll at the end of my talk and asked the audience for direct feedback regarding their understanding of the classical collection and how they thought that we could improve the ways in which we disseminate information about it. As you can see from some of the questions that we posed, there was, as we suspected, a clear demand and need for the installation of a display of non-Egyptological artefacts. Using this crucial feedback, 
we propose that a new display of objects from the ancient world be installed in the museum and serve as a catalyst for student and public engagement and participation with the aforementioned themes. For example, several lecturers already offer modules discussing topics such as racism, diversity, self-presentation and identity in the ancient world. Additionally, Swansea University is one of the few places in the UK offering specialist modules on Egypt, Greece, Rome, Cyprus, Nubia and the ancient Near East. And we really would like to use the opportunity to bring together all of this cutting edge research and display this in this new installation. Therefore, the proposed display on Egypt and its neighbours is likely to be a popular attraction for educators, school groups, university students and, of course, the wider public. Funding secured from the ICS will be used to install a custom made display case, much like the one featured in the slide here. Accompanying this image is a proposed layout of the exhibit. At the top, we have space for a big interpretation panel that will comply with the Welsh language laws and be bilingual in both English and in Welsh. And then a series of shelves underneath displaying artefacts, starting with Egypt and then thinking about the wider Mediterranean around it, with space, of course, for much larger objects to be displayed at the bottom. To give you an idea of some of the artefacts that we are looking at putting on display in this particular installation, I'd like to draw your attention to this small collection here. We have at the top a classical Greek oinokoe, we have a marble head of an unidentified male, and then at the bottom we have a range of artefacts, um, mostly from ancient Cyprus, including a terracotta um, figurine of a horse, some sort of um, cattle figurine and an image of a man holding a sacrificial animal in his arms. We also have what looks like um, a marble head of some sort of female deity at the bottom as well. We also have a small terracotta figurine from Boeotia as well as Roman lamps from Roman Italy. So this is really taking the audience and the viewer beyond Egypt as well to get them to think about different interactions um, of Egypt as a landscape with the wider um, Mediterranean. As already mentioned, public engagement in a pandemic is a genuine challenge, but it really does give us a chance to change things around and improve what we do. Bearing the issues of social distancing and so on in mind, we have thought of a number of initiatives that are mostly online to facilitate and improve engagement, particularly with this new installation. These include things like developing resources online for schools to use as part of their educational activities centred on the display. We would also like to develop a highlights booklet of perhaps around 20 objects that are on display in the case and the entries of around 170 to 200 of words will be composed by staff and students from across the department. There will also be short introductions on the different cultures that the case displays. So, for example, Egypt, Cyprus, Rome, Nubia and so on. There's also an opportunity for us to provide some short write ups on those major themes that we hope to inspire discussion around. So themes of social identity, cultural diversity, tolerance and inclusivity. This is very much something that we can base on our already successful Egypt Centre 30 Highlights booklet. And this was something that was put together by staff in the Egypt Centre based on a poll that was put out to the wider public. And the wider public had this opportunity to vote for their favourite 30 artefacts held in the Egypt Centre. So again, we can see this wonderful collaboration with the local community and the museum itself to disseminate information about its collection. The Egypt Centre is in the process of developing a new website and this will be launched later this year in October. This is yet another really important platform for us to develop even more interactive resources to improve how we engage with our students, schools and the wider public. Here you can see the landing page of the new site and over the next two slides I can give you a sneak peek at how the new catalogue is shaping up. 
Here you can see how clearly artefacts from the collection are set out. Searches can be made based on a number of criteria, all marked out here at the top of the page. And objects are listed with a title, a museum number, a photograph and a short description. And when you click on an artefact, you'll be brought to a page which provides you with a description of the object itself, its vital statistics on one side of the screen, and then a wonderfully new photograph of the artefact showing the object from a range of different angles so that you can fully appreciate all of its qualities. So, for example, what we have here is GR1, that terracotta figurine of an individual holding a sacrificial um, animal. So this is one of my favourite items from the Cypriot collection um, in the museum. One thing that we can certainly do to enhance the installation of this new display and bring it to life to audiences that aren't able to actually go into the museum themselves and look at the, um, the case would be to provide audio recordings, discussions, podcasts and the like and link these to the page so that people can really get to grips with these artefacts and think about these wider themes that we're hoping to, in to inspire discussion around. Another thing that is really worth mentioning is that we have a number of colleagues, not only based across the UK, interested in engaging with our collections here, but also globally, particularly in Egypt. And one thing that we are certainly looking towards is to develop um, commentary and discussion in a range of languages. So not only will this be in English and in Welsh, but we are looking to developing content in Arabic as well, so that we really have a global reach when it comes to thinking about cultural heritage, what this means for different audiences, and really engaging people with these crucial themes that this new installation will inspire. As you can see, this work is ongoing. And funding secured from the ICS really does provide us with a crucial kickstart to the next phase of our project. The impact of this stage of our collaboration and of course our plans for the future will be measured and guided through feedback that we plan to gather from students, our volunteers and of course from the wider public. We envisage this being something that we do by taking polls at the end of public engagement talks by getting museum visitors to fill out questionnaires and by gathering data regarding the website usage. We would really like you to keep in touch with us and follow our developments. So please do engage with our Twitter accounts, the blogs that we post regarding the work and get in touch with us directly. It remains for me to just say once again, thank you so much for your support and for listening. Thanks. Uh, well, she's not there, but thanks to Ersin for this wonderful presentation, uh, which of course we'll we'll put out uh, as part of this recording. And just to say, we'll also, as we tweet, I think Emma and I will tweet links for everything that's been mentioned uh, in both of our presentations, so that you can follow along with all the blogs and further details. Uh, our first comment is from Michael Eads. He says, it's always good to hear from the Swansea Egypt Centre, some great Being Human festival events from there over the years. Smiley face. <laughs> great. Uh, and the first question is from Emma, um, who's been in my brain and stolen my question, which is, uh, Ken, I'd like to ask what, from your point of view, uh, based in the museum, makes for a good collaboration with someone in a university department? Are these things which researchers based, or are there things in which research space and university should do in order to make these collaborations work well. Ken. Well, before I um, answer that, I'd just like to say thank you to obviously the anonymous donors as well as yourselves as part of the uh, the panel for awarding this to Urson and the Egypt Centre. It really means a lot and it's a project I think that can really be quite successful. Uh, so we're looking forward to really working on this over the coming months or well, hopefully with Urson once she's back to normal life again, if that's even possible with a, a new child on the way. Uh, she's in the early stages of, uh, of labour and has uh, passed on her regards to everybody, as well as thanks. In terms of working with, uh, with the museum uh, and the department, this is something that we've been doing at the Egypt Centre for uh, well over 20 years now, even before the Egypt Centre was created. In fact, the collection itself arrived to Swansea in 1971 as a teaching collection. 
uh, from the Wellcome trustees. Uh, so the association has been very close. But what I would say is in the department, there's probably around about 15 or so lectures in Egyptology, ancient history and classics. And there's actually not that many that do work very closely with the collection. So I think what you need is to, to have people who are really willing. Uh, the Egypt Centre has always been open and approachable in terms of being uh, able to offer handling sessions for uh, students as well as lecturers. Uh, something that we've been really pushing in the last few years, particularly for the non-Egyptological material that we have, uh, which has certainly been overlooked in the last, uh, well, 20 years or so. Uh, I think it's also important that the museum is able to offer something for the students. Uh, that's what the lecturers, uh, the departments are going to be looking for. What can we really give the students? Uh, and in terms of that, uh, obviously, they're getting this unique opportunity to handle objects, to work very closely with them. Uh, they're gaining valuable, uh, whether it's volunteering skills as well as um, kind of almost archaeological skills by looking at the objects that we have in the collection if they do go to work on uh, excavations and stuff like that. And uh, they have to have a, a reciprocal arrangement. So we need to get something back from the department as well, which we do. Um, most of us who work, uh, work in the Egypt Centre will have a background in Egyptology, so not so much in the classics and ancient history, which is where Urson and Nigel Pollard and others can really come in and help us to better understand parts of the collection which we don't really know uh, much about. Uh, what I would say is that certainly the colleagues that have been working with us closely in, in recent years, and this, uh, and mostly it does seem to be the younger colleagues, so I don't know whether that's a new thing that's coming through that a lot of the younger uh, academics that are coming through are more interested in working working with museums with a more of a hands-on approach rather than simply with the uh, powerpoint lectures and other uh, lecturing styles uh, but we are very grateful to the department for working very closely with us so i hope that answered the question wonderful thanks yeah and and i think some follow-on comments have appeared uh, from caroline graves brown who says she thinks mutual respect between all groups is vital to collaboration and the the Urson and Ken are very enthusiastic. Car <laughs> Carolyn is, is the curator of the Egypt Centre, by the way. Ah, right. Okay. <laughs> That's a planted comment. Uh, we also have a, a comment from a student, S. Powell. As an Egyptology student at Swansea, I can honestly say the access to the collection and experience volunteering in ancient Egypt Centre was val invaluable. Such a wonderful resource. That's That's wonderful to to see students uh, very much benefiting from that. Um, yeah, we try and get the students as involved as possible, really, uh, in the work, uh, to, to give them the, the, the hands-on approach, the, the real-life uh, experience uh, that they have. And, of course, everybody knows that working with objects, it's, 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 uh, it's much easier to do so in terms of retention of memory uh, that mm -hmm. you're doing there rather than simply looking at pictures. So it certainly helps that way. It's much much easier to teach and better to teach this way. Not always yeah. possible, of course. Uh, I think the students at all levels, one of the great things about, I'm sure you'll find with museums, is that people are surprised by what's available, but also people learn differently, don't they? And I think, you know, and handling objects and things, seeing things in the flesh or the stone or the terracotta yeah. is, is a great way to, uh, to really think about things. Um, no, Caroline will certainly say that when we started uh, the Egypt Centre 20 odd years ago and we were offering students as well as school children the opportunity to handle and handle objects, uh, there were certainly a lot of academics that looked very down at the Egypt Centre to say, why would you possibly allow children to handle objects? But now that is changing. And I think there's more of the understanding of the benefits of object centred learning. Yeah, wonderful. Um, we have another question here from Alice. Uh, in developing your resources for schools, are you concentrating on primary schools or are you looking at the relevance to KS4 and 5 uh, ancient history and classical civilization specs? Most of the school groups that we do get are primary school students uh, at, the, at the Egypt Centre. We do often get secondary school students, but not, not in huge numbers. And this is certainly something I think which would be really great to um, really increase, uh, particularly uh, those that are uh, doing their GCSEs and A-levels, per perhaps they want to go on and do classics at university level. So this is really a good, uh, a good bridge between 
the, the classroom and moving into uh, university life. Uh, but we also want this to be uh, the, the project to be suitable as well for um, graduate students at the same time. So it's really open to all levels uh, that this is going to be working on. Yeah, wonderful. And as Carolyn points out here, um, this kind of object centred learning and all the public engagement coming along with it just has so many pluses. Uh, and so we're, we're very happy that, that you know, it, it's going on. <laughs> Don't get me started, she says. <laughs> on that note, do we have any further questions for Ken? Um, I'm just conscious of time. There's lots to ask and I'm sure that conversations can continue over social media and Twitter and email and so on. And we'll hear more from uh, all of our projects that we've heard about today and more besides uh, from the ICS. So thank you, Ken. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to pass over now to Professor Greg Wolf, Director of the ICS, and I'll mute myself so that you can listen to him. Thank you. Thanks, April. Thanks, everybody. Can you all hear me? Great, thanks. Um, well, first thing I wanted to say is to add my congratulations to Sally and Susanna and to uh, Essen and Ken uh, for you know, these fantastic projects. I really enjoyed hearing about them. Um, I wasn't on the panel, but I sneaked a peek at the range of people who'd applied and all the things they'd done. And it was a really amazing group of projects and amazing in quality, but also just so diverse. So uh, such a huge number of ways in which people have been doing public engagement of, of something classical all over the country. So that, that was really nice to see as well. I also wanted to add my thanks to the anonymous donor who made this possible. Um, it's very nice to see people noticing the importance of public engagement and then coming forward and saying, we'd like to back it some more. Um, and that's what happened in this case. And I hope it'll happen in other cases in the future. Uh, I want to thank April and other members of the panel. Um, it's interesting, it's fun, but it's also extra work uh, reading all these things. And um, yeah, the ICS uh, has a tiny staff and could, couldn't do anything uh, like what it does without people around the country, like April and others, uh, helping out, lending expertise uh, and contributing time and so on. Um, and the other person I want to thank is Emma. Uh, those uh, Many people here know that the ICS staff is about to get even tinier. And in the worst way right, that Emma's coming to the end of her contract, we'd all, I think, hoped that um, one way or another, the university um, would extend the contracts and that Emma would stay with us for longer, permanently, forever, um, chained to her desk. But um, that didn't happen. And um, I think a lot of us feel pretty fed up about that. Even though even those of us who've seen the spreadsheets, but uh, this is a moment I think to say thank you to Emma for so much that you've done, and uh, I know lots of people on this call will have seen one or more things that Emma's done, but I suspect almost nobody knows all the things that she's done in three years here. We hired Emma as the first ever dedicated public engagement fellow in classics in the country. And I, I at least didn't have very much idea what she'd do. I just knew that it would be really well done. Um, and it's been extraordinary to see what's happened. So many will know about the, the regular grant scheme, which we will continue after she goes. Um, tiny amounts of money, which we spread out every possible project you can imagine. Um, and many will probably also have uh, followed the blog, which Emma set up and now has, um, I think about, I, the last time I checked, about 40 odd posts on it, maybe more. Um, and of which they're all about public engagement. They talk about other things, people coming through the ICS, conferences, visiting fellows, uh, other activities, creative work, but public engagement's a really good big bit of that. And so, if anyone ever is asked overnight to turn up at a departmental Zoom meeting and say, what is public engagement in classics? There are worse ways to cram than skimming Emma's blog and just seeing all the different things that, that have happened. And as April's, uh, as, as, as um, Sally and Susanna said, I mean, Emma's way of doing this isn't to say, well, here's some money, uh, write in and tell them what you do. It's to get involved and give advice and uh, infuse and suggest other things and suggest contacts you can make with other people who've done it and so 
you know, that, that body of enthusiasm and knowledge in the country has really significantly grown in size in the last three years. And that really is down to Emma. And we're really grateful for that. Um, if you want something that's, that's less of a quick fun read than the blog, but very interesting, there's the report that Emma did on public engagement across the whole country. And this is, this I think has thrown lots of interesting things into relief and everything from um, what are the best kind of collaborators, who are the most common partners, what are the methods people have used, what are the different audiences people reach out to? Because uh, as emerges very rapidly from reading this, there's not one public, there are many, many publics. Um, and, and the same things don't work for everybody. And I'm sure you don't need me emphasizing that, but it's very interesting to see how Emma's put it together, mapped it out, looked at, also looked at what can be done with very small amounts of money. And we live in a, a research landscape that particularly likes very large grants. It likes to find ways to give somebody a six figure sum. Uh, you know, usually they have to provide a, you know, a three figure application first, um, but uh, you know, we're being directed to a bigger and bigger projects. And one of the things I think Emma's shown, both in practice and through her research, is how much can be achieved with just a few hundred. It can also, what's needed, a bit of recognition from the institutions. And very, very often we find people doing this on top of their workload, or in addition, or in their spare time. And it would be really nice if the institutions that make a lot of fuss on their website and so on, about how much they engage with the local communities and talk to the public. If they actually kind of recognise this and the people are actually doing it. Uh, when Emma's done some of her training events, which is another thing that she's been doing, uh, she and I have occasionally looked around the room and tried to spot the men and then tried to spot the professors and then tried to spot the professors who aren't men. And, you know, this is, a, <laughs> you know, it's very clear that there's a, there's a very important bit of our national community working very hard on this, uh, uh, but it's not quite as representative as it could be. I mentioned the report, the blog, um, the courses. Um, Emma won't be able to give the courses next year that we get that we've been giving so far, but she's put a course online which you can do now, and it's up there on the ICS website. And I, I know, so uh, I kind of road test this as a sort of you know, ignorant but classically informed layperson, and it, it is really, really good. And I know lots of other people have found it really useful as well. Uh, and then yeah, perhaps the, the thing that I've learned most from working with Emma over these three years is how public engagement isn't just about taking something we've done, research, knowledge, and then sort of pushing it out the door. It's also about drawing people in. And it's that sense of inclusivity, of involving people, of, of reaching groups for whom classics was the most distant and obscure subject and bringing them in that, that Emma has championed and publicise and really you know, enthuse the rest of us to do. And we will keep doing it. The Institute will keep doing it. Um, and I'm sure in one way or another, uh, Emma will keep doing things like this. So that's really, um, in a very short space, uh, trying to sum up all the things that I'm grateful for over the last three years and to say, Emma, thank you very much indeed. I think this is now the moment where we probably end the meeting, isn't it? But first, okay, thank you everybody, bye-bye.